The next book I read in the summer of 2024 was Canal Dreams by Ian Banks. And look, it's probably not the book you would expect from Banks, especially if you are coming to it from The Wasp Factory or any of the culture novels, thinking you're going to get something high concept. This book is just not that. Banks himself wasn't very fond of it, something he was pretty open about in interviews. And if you have some familiarity with Banks, you can probably imagine how that shapes your expectations going in. This isn't a book he pointed to with pride. Rather, he claimed it to be some passing attempt at a political thriller that never quite gelled into his usual unhinged brilliance. But despite all that, I kind of liked it. It's definitely not perfect. In fact, it's pretty deeply flawed with a really nasty tonal shift in the back half. But boy, if it isn't entertaining. The premise sounds deceptively simple. We follow Hisako Onoda, a famous Japanese cellist who winds up on a cargo ship crossing the Panama Canal on her way to a concert in Rotterdam, all because she's too afraid to just get on a plane. The ship is forced to drop anchor in the canal due to some political upheaval that Banks was clearly pulling from real-world events in the late 80s, and from there, things spiral incredibly quickly. Hisako and the ship's crew become captives of a group of People's Liberation Front guerrillas, and they end up being brutalized in ways that are, at times, honestly difficult to read. And this is where the book gets exceedingly dark. If it were published today, it would undoubtedly come with a trigger warning, particularly for an extended scene of sexual violence that occurs about halfway through. It's terribly ugly and kind of like Banks was daring himself to get really transgressive here, though it doesn't seem to just be about shock value. There's real trauma in these scenes, trauma you can't look away from and aren't really meant to. But it's also the kind of trauma that makes you wonder whether Banks knew what he wanted his readers to take away from it. I mean, he was a master of his craft, so I'm sure he did, but still. It's all handled with a mix of gravitas and something that feels uncomfortably like a need to punish the characters and maybe even the reader, <laughs> which left me thinking, was that really necessary? Could this story have worked without it? And the answer is probably, but, and it feels terrible to say, but the twisted tale of revenge the story becomes just wouldn't have been nearly as satisfying. So yeah, the back half of the book is heavy and it lingers over moments that are sometimes hard to justify as purely narrative choices. But here's the thing. I still found the book weirdly enjoyable, which is not a word I feel great about using for something that includes such brutal content, but there it is. I think the reason I kept reading is because on a structural level, Canal Dreams works. It's an airtight, well-paced thriller that knows exactly when to slow down and let you sit with the tension, and then when to ratchet everything back up to a near unbearable pitch. Hisako's character art, as unsettling as it is, makes sense within the world of the novel. She starts the book scared and emotionally paralyzed, and she ends it having transformed into a righteous vessel of wrath, as though survival rather than music ends up becoming her art form. In this sense, Banks is doing something quietly clever with genre expectations. You crack the book open thinking it's going to be a kind of political thriller with some international intrigue, maybe a bit of moral ambiguity thrown in for good measure. But what you actually get is something closer to existential horror. It's about what happens to a person when their sense of safety and self gets obliterated. The violence in the book isn't just physical, it's 
emotional and psychological. And Banks handles those elements with a finesse that I have come to expect from him, even if the darker sequences feel at times just a bit gratuitous. It's also worth noting that there are some particularly beautiful scenes scattered throughout. Banks always had a way with prose, and even here, writing what is, by his own admission, not one of his better books, there are moments that shine. His descriptions of the Panamanian landscape are vivid and evocative, and his portrayal of Hisako's dreams are haunting, like something straight out of a novel of magical realism. And it's these small touches that remind you now and then that Banks was capable of absolutely extraordinary things even when he was apparently phoning it in. So I give Canal Dreams four stars out of five, but it's probably my least favorite of Banksy's works that I've read so far. It's definitely not a masterpiece by any means, and it's certainly not the first Banks book I'd recommend to someone new to him. I would go with The Wasp Factory as the publication order starting point to his mainstream work, or consider Philebus as the publication order starting point to his sci-fi stuff. But for what it is, Canal Dreams is pretty darn good. It's messy and uncomfortable, sure, but it's also compelling in a way that I didn't quite expect, a way that's totally different from how Banks is normally compelling. Banks is an author I love. And as I've stated before, I'm trying to consume everything he ever wrote. This may have been his least favorite of his own books, but it still has something in it that is absolutely worth experiencing. In my tier ranking of the books I've read in 2024, I place Canal Dreams right here, just behind Espadere Street. I definitely liked it despite its flaws, but thematically, Espadere Street resonated with me a bit more. I am a musician after all. Next up on my Banks journey is his 1992 novel, The Crow Road. But I think I may have talked a few friends into a culture series read-along, so that may end up taking precedence. We'll see. Stay tuned. If you've read Canal Dreams, I would love to discuss it with you down below. Otherwise, I will catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.